Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you all out this morning in the house of the Lord. Um, Perhaps um, we could just turn to a few verses in Psalm 104. You don't need to turn to it, but as we look out this morning in that uh, beautiful morning, um, I thought a couple of verses from Psalm 104. So verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. And down to verse 24, and it says there, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. And if we were to read on through the verses preceding that, we see the description as the psalmist pens of, of God's great creation. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. And then finally down to verse 31, and it says, The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, praise ye the Lord. And this morning, as we come to worship, uh, perhaps we could just stand and sing, and like the psalmist, let us bless the Lord uh, and praise him as we sing. And we're going to stand together and sing uh, 518, and hopefully it comes up on the screen behind me. All that thrills my soul is Jesus.
Thank you for that good singing. Uh, perhaps we could just still ourselves in God's presence and pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you again for the opportunity to gather together in your house and in your presence. And Lord, we thank you that we can come even into your very presence this morning because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, that access, that open access that he has provided because of his so great sacrifice and salvation. We thank you, Lord, that as we consider what he has done for us, our debt has been paid, our sins have been forgiven, and Lord, that for those of us who know you, that one day we'll be with you in heaven, and we thank you again for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, even as we've even considered already this morning, as we look around us, we see your great creation and Lord, we can see your hand in all around us. And Lord, we're even reminded of all that you provide for us, even on a daily basis. Lord, those things that so often we can take for granted, but our food, our clothes, our health, our homes, our families, our friends. Lord, we just thank you again for each one. And Lord, as we gather here this morning, we're mindful of those in our midst and even, Lord, those at home perhaps listening in who are unwell. And Lord, we just pray that you would draw especially close to them. Lord, that you would give them a measure of your strength. Lord, that you would give them a real sense of your presence and help. And Lord, just be on to them all that they need at this time. Lord, we think of those in other lands this morning who perhaps are meeting in secret. Lord, those who face persecution, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we just lift them up before you, Lord. We think especially this morning of those in Ukraine, and we pray, Lord, that you would bless them and help them. And Lord, we pray for that situation, and Lord, we know that the only way that it can truly be resolved in peace is through salvation of souls. And so, Lord, we even pray for the leaders of the lands. We pray for Mr. Putin and Mr. Zelensky, that, Lord, that even that you would work in their hearts and lives. And, Lord, as we pray for there, we pray for our own land. And, Lord, we just pray for our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you would work and that you would overrule, Lord, but those even who would seek to promote those things which are contrary to your word, Lord, that you would even work in their hearts and lives, turn them to you even today, we pray, Lord. And Lord, we pray even for our own families, our friends, neighbors, our work colleagues, those even around us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would work in their lives. We pray even for the gospel service this evening that you would draw in the unsaved and Lord even for those who might listen in online tonight or at a later time that you would speak to them and Lord that we would be pleased to hear of those who've trusted in thee for salvation and so Lord we just pray that you would be with us this morning Lord give us a real sense of your presence and Lord that indeed as we would leave later on that we would be glad that we have spent time in your presence, that we've been refreshed by your word and Lord that you would have spoken to us and Lord that we would hear and seek to obey. And so Lord we just ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well as I've already said you're all very welcome this morning and I do want to welcome especially uh, Pastor Victor Maxwell, no stranger to us, and, and his wife Audrey. Uh, we're delighted to have you this morning, and at this point I'm just going to hand over uh, for the children's address. Thank, thank you. And thank you, Stephen. Good morning, boys and girls, and good morning, everyone. Just a, a joy to be with you on a beautiful Sunday morning in this lovely part of the countryside. I'm especially glad to see the boys and girls here with us this morning. 
because I tend to bring with me my, my Brazilian bag. I mean, I haven't been to the market this morning or anything like that, but you'll never believe it, but in here I've got uh, frogs and of snakes and small crocodile and, uh, let me see, oh, a piranha fish. Thankfully it's dead, so don't be worrying about it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take my piranha out of here. Let me see. There's a, a small piranha. And you've heard about piranha biting people, eating people. And, and my philosophy is it's better to eat them than them eat me. So we've eaten many, many piranha when we lived in the Amazon. But what I wanted to, to really bring with you this morning is something I've got here. It's a blue pipe. Now, a blue pipe may not be very interesting to you, but if you lived in the Amazon and you lived with the boys and girls out there, why well, you'd have to practice with a blue pipe because especially the Indians in the forest, if they're going looking for birds or small animals or even fish, they will use a blue pipe. And the children, they will use start on a small one like this. I mean, sometimes we have blue pipes that would be longer than that piano there, uh, maybe the piano and organ together, a big long ones. And with those, they can take big animals. Uh, let me just... Uh, I was going to put a nap on Stephen's head and try it, but I uh, don't think that would, uh, I don't know what he would do to me later, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the next time until I get more practice. And uh, we'll try the apple or an orange on his head. But when they go out, he'll take the, 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 the arrow, the dart, as we would call it, and put a little poison on the, on the tip of it. The poison will paralyze the bird or the fish or whatever it hits, and... They'll... Oh, that's not terrible. I missed it. So you can tell I haven't practiced this very, very often. But let me see again. How about that, eh? And uh, we'll put more poison on this. Well, that one's already dead, so it didn't kill it. Uh, but you can see, you can see. Oh, knock them both off. Well, that's. That's, that's a blue pipe, very, very important. Now, why I brought it to you this morning is for this reason. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we, well, let's say what the Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith, which is able to quench, that is, to destroy, to protect you from the fiery darts of the evil one. Boys and girls, mums and dads, can I say that the devil is always firing darts into our mind and into our heart. The Bible tells us in another part about him that he's out to destroy us, to kill us, to, to take our faith away from the Lord Jesus. And sometimes he'll blow those darts into our mind to give to us negative thoughts. For example, sometimes the devil will come and blow into our mind and say, there is no God. But you know what the Bible says? The devil is not only a liar, but he is the father of lies. He invents those lies. And uh, when, we, when we remember that, why? The Bible tells us that there is a God. Why? That's where the Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And boys and girls, can I say to you this morning, that's a great way to begin your life knowing that there is a God. Why, on a beautiful morning like this, we see the countryside and wonder how could all of this beauty be if it wasn't the fact that God created it. As a matter of fact, at nighttime, when we look into the heavens, the Bible tells us he not only made all those things, but he sustains, that is, he keeps them all in order. Do you know something? The watch that you have, you can keep the time and know the time because there's order in God's universe. They tell us there's going to be an eclipse of the, the sun in 2030-something. And they can tell you not only the hour, but they can tell you the day. They can tell you the very minute and down to the seconds that it will begin. And why? Simply because there is order in God's universe. Now, that didn't happen. I mean, if I was to take the parts of this watch and throw them all up into the air and let them all fall, do you think they would come together as a watch again? 
No, there would be confusion. But God is on the throne and he is the creator of all things. And when the devil comes and says, there is no God, you just say, the devil is a liar. And another dart the devil will bring is, he'll aim at you and say, there may be a God in heaven, but I don't need him. My friend, can I say, that is also a lie. We all need him. Why, the Bible tells us it's because of him that we live and breathe and, and we are what we are this morning. Because he not only created the whole world, he created you. He not only created you, but he created you for himself. And that is why when, when God is not in our lives and Christ is not in our lives, why our lives are empty, void. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus said these words, Without me you can do nothing. Oh, how, how, how much the devil is allowed to tell us that we don't need God. And can I say to the young people and children here, the Bible says, remember now, when, when you're young, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. In your young days, remember how much you need him. I, I thank God that I trusted the Lord Jesus as a young man. And I'll not tell you how many years ago that is, but uh, uh, can I say he made all the difference in life? And I say not only to boys and girls this morning, but to everyone here, we all need him. We need him because he came to save us and we need to be saved. And therefore, when the devil says there is no God, he's a liar. When the devil says, well, we, we don't need him, we don't need salvation, we don't need pardon, he is a liar. A third, a third thing the devil will blow and put into your mind there is no hurry. Doesn't the devil say that? I do remember that before I was converted, why for weeks I, I, I wanted to get saved. I wanted to know my, my sins were forgiven, forgiven. I wanted to know I was going to heaven. But I thought, I'm young. I can, I can wait. I'll do it another time. My friend, can I say this? The Bible tells us we're not to boast about tomorrow. That is, you're not to count on tomorrow. For we don't know what a day may bring forth. When I was converted, I was, there were two boys at school with me. Bobby McIntyre was one and the other, uh, I forget his name, Snod, and I can't remember his, his first name. But Bobby died because of an illness. He had missed school for two weeks and then we got word he wasn't coming back, and a short while later, we heard that Bobby died. He was only 13. But then we heard, before he died, he became a Christian. And you know, that really helped the mum and dad's heart and helped all of us who knew him. However, the other boy who died was knocked down by a bus, and we never heard that he had become a Christian. These two boys thought there was plenty of time but the devil is a liar. Seek now your creator in the days of your youth. And so, boys and girls, when the devil comes and blows those poisonous darts into your mind, always remember this. He is a liar, the father of lies. He's out to destroy you. Whereas God loves you, he sent his only son into the world to be your savior. And he wants you to come to him. Now, Stephen, I'll try to bring an apple on an orange the next time, and uh, I promise to try and buy a better shop, okay? And thank you very much. God bless you all. I'll put this away in case I get it for dinner. Thank you, Pastor. I'll maybe not volunteer the next day, then. Um, just a few announcements then before Pastor Maxwell comes uh, to bring us God's word. Uh, do please remember after this part of the service, uh, we meet together um, around the table in, in memory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're saved and walking in fellowship uh, with the Lord, then you're welcome to stay and uh, partake in that. Please also remember the, the prayer times each Sunday 
um, in the morning, 11, preceding the, the uh, morning worship service, uh, 6 p.m. before the gospel service, and also the early morning prayer meeting uh, at 8 and 8.20, uh, then on Zoom. Remember the gospel service this evening. Uh, Pastor Maxwell will be back this evening again. And again, if you do know anyone unsaved, uh, please do invite them along, bring them along, or indeed, if they're unable to, to come out, uh, point them to our YouTube site that they can, they can tune in and hear the gospel message. Remember also the Sunday school this afternoon at 3.30. Uh, remember the boys and girls there. Tuesday night, ladies, is the, the last walk for life, uh, and that's at 7 o'clock this Tuesday evening. Then on Wednesday evening, our prayer and Bible study this week will be taken by Andrew Daly uh, from Lurgan Baptist, so please remember that. And then, um, as we've been announcing over the past couple of weeks, this Thursday night, so that's this Thursday night, there is the safeguarding training at 7.30 here in the church. And if anyone is involved in any of the youth ministries uh, associated with the church or plans to be helping out, uh, particularly over any of the, the summer activities, then you do need to come along and go through that training. So please do remember that. So that's Thursday at 7.30 here in the church. Next Sunday, uh, our usual services, 11.30 and 6.30, will be taken by Pastor David Anderson from Belize Baptist. And we will have a soloist next Sunday evening, Joanne Fulton from Collibaki. So please do remember those as well in your prayers. And then just uh, an advance notice. Um, we will be having the, the Coaching for You ministry. And that will be the week of May the 30th. So that's May the 30th to June the 3rd. And um, of course, that will come around very, very quickly now. And just in connection with that and with the other ministries over the summer, we will be having a prayer time this evening after the, the gospel service. Um, so that will be focused on uh, the, the summer youth work. So please do remember that. Uh, and of course, all these announcements are given in and subject to the will of the Lord. So I'll hand over now to Pastor Maxwell. Thank you. And Stephen, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be back with you here in Limavady Baptist this morning. I think the last time I was with you was on Zoom, and uh, it's quite unreal uh, meeting people, greeting people uh, in that particular medium. Uh, the COVID, well, I don't know if it's passing, but at least we're able to come back together again. I think they call it COVID-19. The 19 indicates how many pounds you gained during the COVID. I don't know if that was the case with you, but we had more cups of tea and indulging and that sort of thing during the time. But it's good to know that the Lord is absolutely in control. Our Bible reading this morning is taken of two readings, one from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then again from Hebrews chapter 11. While you look for your place, can I say I've brought with me this morning some ACRI literature. This a circular is just out. Audrey and I have been with ACRI Gospel Mission since 1964. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were in Brazil and we were glad to get home before the, the pandemic hit, hit Brazil in a very bad way. We lost a, a lot of good friends, a lot of Christian uh, missionaries and servants of God in that land. Dr. Bill Woods uh, went to Brazil on Tuesday of this week. Dr. Geddes and his wife also went to Brazil uh, Tuesday week ago. They're only there for a short while, but uh, we value prayer for them. However, at the end of the service, I'll give out these acre leaflets, not only the news one, but also a, a, a little um, leaflet for boys and girls with questions and colouring in and story and that sort of thing, and I'll give those out later. However, let's turn to the Word of God this morning as we find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that of our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. 
If so be that being clothed, we have not, uh, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Now, he that hath wrought uh, us for the selfsame thing is God, who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And then to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, please. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whither he went, but by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar, afar off rather, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And amen, God always blesses to us the readings of his sacred word. Now, I know, uh, well, not during pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, Many people enjoyed going to Florida and especially to Orlando to see all the, the great attractions there of Disney World, Water World, even Bible World is there. However, not many people knew of the attraction of the Peabody Hotel. The Peabody Hotel at the end of International Drive was a big attraction. A big attraction because of the March of the Ducks. I don't know if you've ever heard of the March of the Ducks. Nothing to do with Donald Duck, incidentally. But what happened at the Peabody Hotel uh, at the end of International Drive is that 11 o'clock every morning and 5 o'clock every afternoon, five ducks paraded in the atrium, the, the sort of entrance to the hotel. The atrium of the hotel has a beautiful fountain in the middle of it, and what happened at 11 o'clock is that the Star Spangled Banner music began to play. And from below, an American flag, which was draped from the ceiling, uh, out stepped five ducks, marching to the music all the way to the fountain. They stared at the fountain. They ate at the fountain. They, they were around the fountain. And the place was packed just to see these five ducks marching. At 5 o'clock in the evening... Again, the music would start up and the people would gather round and there the ducks would, I said march, no, they, they would waddle from the water and waddle their way back to the American flag and disappear under the curtain. Now, the visitors were there thinking that the ducks were waddling or marching to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner. But what really they were looking for is, it was feeding time. When they played the music, the ducks knew that there was food for them beyond the curtain, beyond the American flag. And therefore, they weren't marching to the music that they heard. They were marching because of what was behind the curtain. I say that this morning because they had a big incentive. My friend, can I say as we read these words of Abraham, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He had a an incentive behind the curtain. 
And that is why I come this morning to look at this portion of Scripture with this in mind. Heaven is not only our destination. Heaven should be our motivation. The Bible reminds us here that Abraham, he sojourned here on this earth as a stranger and a pilgrim. A stranger meant that he was not at home in this earth. As a matter of fact, if you read the life of Abraham, you will find that Abraham never built any houses. He never built a city, Lot. He forsook a tent and went to live in the city, but not Abraham. Abraham's relation to this world was summed up in the fact that he lived in tents, for here he had no continuing city. He was looking for that city that was to come. His citizenship was in heaven, but that citizenship in heaven governed his life here on earth. And my friend, can I say, that's exactly how it is for us. For the Bible reminds us that our citizenship, our conversation is in heaven. We used to sing the hymn, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Abraham's relationship to, to heaven was perhaps summed up in what he did build. What Abraham built here on earth were altars. He was taken up with God and the worship of God and the grace of God and the, the glory of God in his life. And wherever he sojourned, he was building altars. The Bible says he was not only a, a stranger, he was a pilgrim. A stranger is a person who is far from home. A pilgrim is one who is on his way home. And that is exactly, that's exactly how it was with Abraham. He was a builder of altars, simply for he was looking a country, a better country, the, the founder of that country. When we come to Abraham, there is so much we could say about this man. Outside King David and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible has more to say about Abraham than anyone else. As a matter of fact, the first 11 chapters of, of the book of Genesis, they are taken up with the human race, the creation of Adam and Eve, all the way up to chapter 11, but from the end of chapter 11 onwards, it's all taken up with the family of Abraham. Our blessed Lord Jesus is known as the son of Abraham. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, paradise is called the bosom of Abraham. Abraham is referred to 74 times in the New Testament. And perhaps for that reason, he is called the father of the faithful, the father of faith, and also called the friend of God. As I say, there's so much that we could say about the life of Abraham, but perhaps what we want to say today would summarize that life. When we think of Abraham as the father of the faith, we come to see him here in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and what it tells us of him is that he had a very sensitive ear. The Bible says that he heard the voice of God, Abraham, when he was called to go out, that he should uh, he went out that he should after receive an inheritance. He was listening to God. My friend, can I say it is a good thing to have an open ear to God, to hear what God is saying through his word. God speaks to us every day by his sacred word. I like to say that when we open our Bibles, God opens his mouth. For all scripture is given by the inspiration, by the, the breath of God into our into our lives. And Abraham, he had a very sensitive ear to listen to what God was saying. Not only did he have a sensitive ear, but he had stepping feet. He was always walking. The Bible tells us that he went to the country and, he, and then it says he went on and on simply because he was following Jehovah. My friend, can I say that's exactly what we have been called to be. We we have been called to be followers, followers of our blessed Lord Jesus. Uh, we don't want to dwell on that this morning, but other than to say he had a, a sense of fear, he had ready and stepping feet to follow the Lord. But what I do want us to look at this morning is the fact that he had a very steady eye. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Uh, Abraham was very much taken up with cities. 
And that's exactly what I want us to focus in on this morning. You see, in the life of Abraham, to summarize that life, we want to think of something of what we might call the city that was behind him, Ur of the Chaldees. That's where he came from, the city that was behind him. And then we think of the city that was beside him. The Bible reminds us that he lived on the plains of, of Mamre, that is near to present-day Hebron. However, the cities that were beside him were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to think of those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham with his relationship to those cities. The city that was behind him, he wasn't going back there. The city that was beside him, but the city that was before him, that was the important place. He wasn't a citizen anymore of Ur. He wasn't a citizen of Gomorrah. He, rather, he was looking for a country whose builder and maker is God. Down here, he was a pilgrim. And I say again, that was the motivation of his life, just like those ducks going for feeding time. My friend, can I say that God has laid up for us? Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen to it. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. It fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. And my friend, can I say, that should be the big incentive of our lives. Our Lord Jesus Christ, again in the book of Hebrews, the Bible reminds us that our Lord Jesus, when he was going to the cross, when we think of the cross, we see the darkness and the pain and the gore. But the Bible says of our Lord Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, but is now set down on the right hand of the Father. Our Lord Jesus could see beyond the cross and see the joy of pleasing the Father and satisfying divine justice, the joy of bringing his bride home. It was motivation. However, let us go back to think of these things in the life of Abraham. The city that was behind him, it was Ur of the Chaldees. It is very interesting that we don't read of Abraham until he was 75 years of age. 75 years of age. What I think is interesting about that is that we don't read anything about those 75 years. As a matter of fact, when I look at many servants of God in the Bible, uh, before their encounter with God and before the, the transformation of God's grace in their lives, the Bible tells us very little about them. And why? Because those years were wasted years. Don't I say that this morning for those who are out of Christ? Every day out of Christ is a wasted day. Every year away from God is a wasted year. He only began to live when he was 75 years of age, and that's when grace reached Abraham. Ur of the Chaldees uh, was, uh, as we think of it, an ancient city. We have got to know a lot about it now because of archaeologists. Isn't it amazing how when we get older, we get interested in archaeology. I think it's got some to do with age. But archaeologists were able to look in and discover the ruins of Ur of the Chaldees. And although we, we think of those ancient deaths, they weren't cavemen. Ur of the Chaldees was a modern city in, in present-day Iraq. It had a population of up to 300,000 people. It had a, a water system all through the town, a sewer system. Some of the mansions of Ur of the Chaldees had 14 and 15 rooms, and so it was a very prosperous city. However, it was not only a wealthy city, but it was a pagan city. The people of Ur of the Chaldees were, were pagan people who worshipped the sun and the moon, and some of them, like the Egyptians of that time, had a different god for every day of the week. And the thing about Abraham is that before God met him, before grace changed him, my friend, he was probably a moon, a moon worshiper, a, a sun worshiper. He, he worshiped the creation rather than worship the creator. 
But one day, the Bible tells us, he heard the voice of God, even as we've read about it here in this portion of Scripture. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, he went. My friend, it was the day of decision in the life of Abraham, and think what that must have meant. His life completely dominated by ignorance and darkness and all that might have been indulged in in that particular time until the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2 how that God appeared to him, grace reached him and saved him and changed him. And that day, the day of decision, he turned his back on the darkness of the world. He turned his back on the ways of Ur of the Chaldees. He turned his back on pagan practices and the Bible puts it in New Testament language when it says he became a new creature. Something happened in his life. I mention that this morning because the day of your decision to come to Jesus Christ, my friend, means the day of big transformation. We sing the hymn, O happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice to tell its raptures all abroad. The decision that Abraham made on that day, my friend, touches all of us. Did you know that no greater promises were ever given to any man outside Jesus Christ than to Abraham? Outside Jesus Christ, no man so touched the whole world but Abraham. Why? Muslims and Jews, they look to Abraham as their father. We think of him as the father of the faithful. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 12 that not only in his seed would come Messiah, but through his seed all the ends of the earth would be blessed. We are blessed this morning because of Abraham. And it all hinges in that one decision when God appeared to him and he obeyed God. I say that this morning because let's remember this. When we preach the gospel, the gospel is more than an invitation. The gospel is a command. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17 that God has commanded men and women to repent. The Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that verse 7 or verse 8 it says that in that day when Christ comes he shall descend from heaven in flames of fire taking vengeance on all those who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on that day that God appeared to Abraham, Abraham obeyed. He heard the word of God, and it was mingled with faith, and he obeyed the word of God. What a decision that was. I say that this morning because maybe I speak to someone, and you've not yet made that decision in your life. My friend, can I say, it could transform your life and your home, and you don't know where it will end. When you come to the Savior. Think not, think not only of the city that he left, or of the Chaldees, but think also of the direction he took. Can you imagine Abraham when he decided to leave Ur of the Chaldees? Uh, people were asking him, we hear you're leaving, Abraham. Where are you going? I don't know. When God called Abraham, he didn't give to him a road map. He didn't give to him a plan. He just told them to get out of the earth of the Chaldees and to follow. God would lead him. How, how long will it take you? I don't know. You see, the direction was planned by God but wasn't revealed to Abraham. Listen, for Abraham, it was a step at a time, a day at a time, and following Jehovah. My friend, can I say that's exactly how it is for us? The Bible reminds us, we're hearing that you've been studying the book of Romans, and Romans 1.17 reminds us that the just shall live by faith. And that's how it is every day in our Christian lives. That word was first given to Habakkuk. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk couldn't understand what was happening in his world. But he had to take it by faith. And my friend, that's exactly how it is with us. Abraham was stepping out on the word of God and following God's promises. I say again that here is a man who listened to the promises of God. Here is a man who lived by the promises of God. Here is a man who was looking for the city of God. 
And he was doing it all by faith. I think on Zoom last year, we were speaking to you about uh, Peter. Peter getting out of the boat when he said, If it be thy Lord bids me come to thee on the water. It was the middle of the night. It was dark and the sea was raging. The wind was howling. And yet when Peter got the word, come, he got out of the boat and he stepped not just on the water, he stepped on the word. My friend, can I say, if you can picture the crystal life of winds howling around us and uh, the spray of the waves uh, soaking us and, and we're following Jesus, we're going to him. That's a picture of Abraham just day by day, step by step, following Jesus. The just live by faith. And here's the father of the faithful doing just that. The city that was behind him, the decision he made, the direction he took, but the distraction that he had, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 12 that God had commanded him to get out of this city and uh, leave his family. Do you know what Abraham did? He took his father with him. He took his nephew Lot with him. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that when they came to the place Hagar, why, his, his father is the one who held him back. The father became a distraction to him because it delayed him in getting to the promised land. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, you will find that instead of going to the promised land, he put his tent down and he delayed to follow the Lord. Oh, my friend, sometimes it happens to us. Read the story of Pilgrim's Progress. How often he was diverted. Sometimes because of doubts that put him in a dungeon. Sometimes because of distraction that led him into bypass meadow and he got away from following. It can happen to all of us over simple things. But it was not only the father who delayed him, it was also Lot who put him into danger. You remember. He brought his, his son, or his nephew Lot with him. He was supposed to have left Lot in Ur of the Chaldees. What I find about Abraham, that everything that he brought out of Ur of the Chaldees was a liability to him. It either delayed him or put him in danger. And we will see in just a moment in Genesis chapter 14 that when Lot, who left Abraham, the Bible says in Genesis 13 that Lot wanted to dwell in the plains because it looked like the Garden of Eden. How beautiful it was. And so he, he left Abraham and took his tent and pitched towards Sodom. And when we get to chapter 14, he's living in Sodom. My friend, that was... He forsook his tent and forsook his testimony and left his treasure and went to live in Sodom. Oh... And got Abraham into danger. I say again, when we bring the world with us and bring worldly witness with us, everything that we bring gets us into trouble. Gets us into trouble. Abraham and the city that was behind him. Can I say, the Bible tells us here that when he thought of the city, he had no intention of going back to the city. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's no reason to go back. Uh, we love the chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. We sing it, perhaps a little bit glibly, but the roots of that chorus are quite somber and sobering. It all happened because of a missionary from Wales who was converted in the 1907 revival in Wales. God called him to be a missionary, and he went to India, to the northeast hills of India, the lower slopes of the Himalayas. And there amongst pagan people, pagan tribes, he witnessed for Christ. In one particular tribe that was known for its violence, he went and there he witnessed for the Savior. And one man and his family trusted the Savior and decided to follow Jesus. When the chief of the tribe summoned the man before the fathers of the tribe, he asked the man to recant. The man said, no, sir. I've decided to follow Jesus. 
He says, if you don't recant, I'm going to kill your two children. The man said, I can't recant. I've decided to follow Jesus. They killed the two children. The chief came back and said to him, now will you recant? He says, I can't recant. Without going into the story, he said, if you don't recant, I'll kill your wife. To this the chief said, though no one join me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. They killed the wife. The missionary was aware of all this. The chief came back and said, if you, if you don't recant, if you don't turn back, we're going to kill you. To this the man said, the cross before me, the world behind me, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. The Welsh missionary, when he heard the testimony, he wrote the chorus that we sing so easily. Amazingly, because of that one man's testimony, the chief was so impressed that he turned to Christ. He was converted. The whole village turned to Christ because of one man's testimony. Abraham could say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Our time is almost gone and we're still in the of the colonies. Let me just say a few things about the city that was beside him. Or should I say the cities that were beside him? The twin cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't have to say a lot about the cesspool of iniquity, cities that were totally given over by sin. Godlessness abounded in the city. And when I think of the sins of that city, my friend, I'm thinking of our present day society. It is amazing in the scriptures that seven times when God likens judgment, he likens it to the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not amazing. Remember he said of Capernaum, all oh, Capernaum, if the works that had been done and thee had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long since. My friend, can I say today that we are surrounded by the sins of Sodom. We're living in a polluted society. But think of Abraham in relation to the polluted society of his day. Just three things to say about it. First of all, Abraham was separate from the city. Not isolated, as we'll see in a moment, but separate from the city. That is, the sins of Sodom did not soil his life. When you read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, reminds us that the church of Corinth is known as the church of God. What a distinction, the church of God. But as you read down through the book of Corinthians, you will find that the pollution of Corinth had got into the church. And that was a sad thing. Why, there was drunkenness and division and immorality. Society had got into the church. We used to say when we lived in the Amazon and those little small dugout canoes sometimes are going out at night when from the top of the canoe to the water edge is only about two or three inches. I remember being out one night with Bill Woods on the river. Our mission launch had loosed its moorings, was drifting down river and Bill and I were after it. I mean, if you just tipped it one side or the other, why, the river got into the canoe. As long as the canoe was in the river, we were safe. But once the river got into the canoe, we weren't safe. My friend, can I say of Abraham, he never let Sodom get into his life. He never let the sins of Sodom soil his life. And I say that because the Bible tells us that we are to be separate from the world. Now, I know that the word separation is not a popular word, but listen to what the scriptures say uh, over there in 1 John. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Listen to what it says. Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? James said these words, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world, not to be spotted with the sins of society. The Bible reminds us we are not only to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, but we are to be transformed in our minds, not to be conformed to this world. Later on in his ministry, Paul lamented that Demas, 
Demas, who had been a servant of God and a follower of Jesus, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Abraham lives separate, uh, separate from this city. But do you know something? Although he was separate from the city, he served the city. He served the city. In Genesis chapter 14, it tells us that when Lot went to live now in Sodom, dwelling in Sodom, the kings that came, ten kings came and took captive. They took the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. They led them away and Lot was taken prisoner. Isn't that a sad testimony? Do, do you think Abraham sat back and said, well, serve you right for doing that? No. In Genesis chapter 14, the Bible tells us that Abraham got together 300 brave men who went after the kings and he defeated 10 kings in a whole night and he brought Lot and the inhabitants of, of Sodom and Gomorrah back to them. He, he freed them. And why did he do it? Simply because he was in the world, but not of the world. He was here to serve the world. My friend, our Lord Jesus in his prayer reminds us that he has not taken us out of the world. We are here as his servants. Serving, so sad. We're not to be isolated from them. We're not to, as it were, cloister ourselves in behind monastery walls. The Bible says we are to be salt of the earth. We are to be lights in the world. Let your light shine before men. We're, we're to testify, speak for Jesus, live for Jesus. Every, and that was Abraham. He was separate from the city, but he served the city. Can I say that's a great balance to have? Time is almost gone and now we're in Sodom. Let me just say this. He, he not only was separate from the city and he not only served the city, the Bible tells us how he prayed for the city. He supplicated for the city. In Genesis chapter 18, the Bible tells us that God came and visited Abraham in his tents on the plain of Mamre and told, the, told Abraham that he was going down to Sodom. He was going to destroy the city. A fire and brimstone would fall upon the city. Do you know what Abraham did? Abraham began to pray. And he prayed passionately. He prayed for the city. He prayed for Lot. And he prayed, Lord, if there be 50 people in the city who are just and righteous, would you spare the city? God said, I'll spare it. Lord, you're merciful that there are 45 people in the city. If there are 30, if there are 20. He bargained God down to 10. If there are 10 people in the city. God said, if I find 10 people in the city who are righteous, I'll not destroy the city, but they couldn't find 10 people. It's the words of, Abraham, of Habakkuk. Looking at the sins of his day, he said, oh God, in wrath, remember mercy. Let's remember this. People around us need the Lord. Every day they pass us by, we rub shoulders with them. And do you know what the Bible says of them? The wrath of God abides upon them, my friend. Abraham was concerned for the city. He prayed for the city. And I say this because oftentimes our prayer meeting, well, we need to pray for the sick of our congregations. And we need, but can I say how we need to labor in prayer for those who are, are lost. Remember our blessed Lord Jesus on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. He looked in the city of Jerusalem and he wept and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered thee as a hen gathers her chicks, but when I would, you would not. He said to the Pharisees, you will not come to me that you might have life. Oh, Abraham supplicated for the city. The city behind him the city beside him, the city before him. The city before him, my friend, is the city that's before us. The Bible tells us, and maybe we'll say a little bit about that this evening. The Bible reminds me, my friend, that uh, we're going to a city where we will sit down with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. They shall come from the east and the west and the north and the south and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What, what, what a day that's going to be. What a place that's going to be. We, over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this word, 
For we know that of this earthly tabernacle, remember we said Abraham lived in a tent? We're living in tents. We're living in tents. This is only a tent. One day, the pegs will be pulled and the tent will be vacant. We're looking for a city. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 says we not only know that this tent will be dissolved, but we have a building of God not made with hands. It's not speaking of a building of a temple or of heaven. It's speaking of a glorified body. Isn't it? When we lived in Brazil on a Sunday afternoon, we'd go and visit the leprosy patients. And many of them didn't have fingers or hands left or they didn't have feet left. And Alberto, he had, no, he had no hands, he had no feet, he had no, no sight because of scars that had destroyed his eyes. One day when I took David McGackey, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church, out to visit Alberto, David McGackey, why the tears just ran down his eyes, because Alberto had Jesus in his heart. <laughs> and he said, would you tell your minister, speak to me in Portuguese, I'd like to give him a chapter of the Bible. I said, Alberto, what chapter? He said, Psalm 119. He said, all of it? Yeah, well, he, he can't read, he can't see. How, how did he know it? Well, Fred Orr and friends had bought him a tape recorder. And he could listen to the Bible. Now, remember, he had no fingers to turn a tape recorder on. But when we met Alberto, at first he had two teeth, one up and one down. He used to say, thank God the meat. That's how he turned on his tape recorder, two teeth. Listen to a verse. And 176 verses he had learned because of that. I said, just give us the first eight verses. And he just went after them. But I said, when we went on a Sunday afternoon to visit those leprosy patients, at the end of it, we'd meet together and we'd sing choruses for them. But they all were sang at the end of our visit. Maranatha, 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 Oraving, Senor Jesus. They're singing Maranatha. They're longing for Jesus to come. Why? Philippians 3.21 says that when Christ comes, he will transform this vile body, this broken, corrupt body, to be like unto his glorious body. <laughs> Is it for that reason Paul says that in this body we groan? We know that we'll be transformed. We're groaning now. But then Paul says later, but we are confident, we are confident but though we're absent from the body one day, we'll be present with the Lord. Wherefore, it says we are to glorify God. You're a Christian. There's a city before you this morning. And remember the ducks of the Peabody Hotel. It doesn't exist anymore, incidentally. It's been taken over by another company that stopped in 2013. But the march of the ducks was not to the music of the world, it was to the incentive beyond the curtain. We've got a great incentive. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless thy sacred word to all of our hearts this morning and help us to be listeners of the word of God. Help us to be faithful followers in the steps of our Savior. And our Father, we ask of thee that you will help us to live so that we're looking and longing for the coming of our blessed Lord. Bless us now as we sit to remember the Lord Jesus and be with those who must leave, we ask. In Christ's name. Yeah, let's, as we come to the table this morning, sing hymn number 177. Jesus was slain for me.
just to open our Bible at Isaiah 53. Martin Luther called it the golden chapter of the Bible. We're just going to read three verses, verses three through five. And it's speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quite amazing that this was written 700 years before the Lord Jesus came to earth. And yet in verse three, it says of him, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. It is with good reason that Martin Luther called this the golden chapter of the Bible because it's all about our Savior. When Isaac Watts wrote the hymn, uh, oh, the first line's gone, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Amazing, he wrote that hymn 350 years ago and we still sing it, but the hymn got him into trouble at that time because they said that in hymnody, nobody had ever put in the personal pronouns I, when I survey the wondrous cross. But can I say there are a lot of personal pronouns in this chapter? For it's all about him, the Lord Jesus, and us, what he did for us. Let me just underline three simple thoughts. First of all, it's telling us here of the, of the burden our Savior bore. They called him the man of sorrows. Think of the life of the Lord Jesus and think, or what they might have called him. They might have called him the man of miracles. No man did the miracles that he did. They might have called him the man of love. Nobody ever loved like Jesus loved. The, the man of power. We could go on. The, the man of majesty. He's the king. But he is known as the man of sorrows. Why? Because he took our sorrows. That's why he came. Sin that brought sorrow into the world. It's quite amazing. Sorrow was never known in the Garden of Eden. Sorrow came because of sin. And when we get to the last chapters of the Bible, the last two chapters, sorrow of God. Philip, of course, he was preaching for us recently in heaven, there'd be no more sorrow. And he said, Good riddance. Good riddance. No more sorrow, suffering. But Jesus bore our sorrows, the man of sorrow, the burden he bore. Think of the bruising he felt. What do we read in verse 5? He was wounded for our transgression. Was anyone ever beaten like the Savior was beaten? Uh, the Bible tells us how human hands took him and crucified him. They scourged him. They crowned him with thorns. They spat upon him. They kneeled him. They took a spear and punctured it into his side. Oh, this man of sorrows was crucified for us. And we will never understand how deep were the sufferings of our Lord. Oh, we're speaking of physical sufferings, but the Bible gives to us a window to look in on the heart of our Lord Jesus when God laid upon him the sins of the world. We'll never understand what that meant. We're coming to this table to remember the burden he bore was our burden. The bruising he felt was in our place. The blessings he gave us by his stripes we are healed. That's why we're here this morning. We are, what does it say in him? Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven who like us his praise should sing at that verse 5 and with this I finish take the first few words of that verse and compare them to the last few words he was wounded we are healed that's why we're at this table this morning some brother is going to lead us in thanksgiving for the 
the bread that speaks to us of the body that was broken for us. And then following in due course, some brother leading us in thanksgiving for the cup.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We can say you've brought us into the banqueting house. We thank you. We can confidently say your banner over us is love. Dear Lord, we thank you for your unfailing love. New every morning and great is your faithfulness. We pray your blessing on each person here present and as we enter into this new week, we pray that you'll go before us. And as we've been thinking of Abraham this morning, we remember the scriptures to say that this God shall be our God and he shall be our guide even unto death. So accept our thanks and bless us now, we ask in Christ's name.